Well, this morning we're going to continue our series, Christmas Wonder. So I'd like to invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We'll be in Luke chapter number two this morning as we continue the Christmas story. Luke chapter number two. If you don't have your Bible, the verses should be there in your notes as well. We'll begin this morning in verse number eight of Luke chapter number two. Verse eight reads, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, And see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary, and Joseph, and the babe, lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the story of the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you uh, for the announcement that we've read in Scripture and how it will speak to our hearts and lives. I pray that uh, you would illuminate our hearts as we uh, read through this text this morning together. And I pray that you would convict us and change us to be more like you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, our series this month is a series that we've called The Wonder of Christmas. And one of the reasons that we chose that title is because, sadly, over the years, perhaps you've seen it as well, there are Christians who can lose the wonder of it all. Uh, They just kind of get that attitude, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and uh, when it comes to hearing about Christmas, when it comes to really thinking through what this is all about, uh, they have a spirit that is uh, not a spirit of expectancy, not a spirit of worship, but just a spirit that says, you know what, Uh, I've already done all of this. And sad to say, that can happen to people who have been saved for many, many years. In fact, in the book of the Revelation, as John the Revelator wrote to the Ephesian church, he reminded them that they had lost their first what? Love. They lost their first love. And if you've ever uh, been a Christian for very long and if you've ever watched someone's life that kind of uh, begins to backslide, uh, you can tell that they've lost their first love because they start falling in love with other things. They start giving a lot more attention to other things than they do to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, we don't want to lose the wonder of it all. We want to stay freshly in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard about a young family that was getting ready to go visit their parents at Christmas time, and uh, they had uh, the mail canceled for a while. They had their newspaper canceled. They had their neighbor wash the house. They took care of the animals. They got everything packed into the car. They got uh, antifreeze in the in the radiator. They checked the oil. They did everything they could to get ready for this trip. They had special uh, goodies to snack on and coffee that was made. And the husband and wife they got ready for the trip. They jumped in the car, and right as they were about ready to pull out the husband looked at the wife and said, we forgot the baby. (laughs) Not a good thing. And maybe you've been there before. Well, that's how some people are when it comes to Christmas. They get every last detail and they forget the baby, the Christ child. They forget really what this is all about. Well, we want to be very intentional about remembering Jesus this month. 
And we want Jesus Christ to be central in all that we say and in all that we do. And so as we come to Luke chapter 2, we probably are preaching through what some would consider to be the most central passage of the Christmas story. And I want you to notice as we look this morning at our wonderful Savior, three truths that I believe are dominant truths for us to really contemplate today. First of all, I want you to notice with me a wonderful condescension. We want to see Jesus condescending to our low estate. And I want you to see what I mean by that. In verse eight, the Bible tells us here in Luke chapter two about Jesus Christ coming and how uh, he condescended. It says, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Now what I want you to see, first of all, as we hear the message from the angel of the Lord, is that this condescension of Jesus Christ is to common men. Jesus is sharing the message with very common men. These are some of the most unlikely recipients to hear the message of the King of Kings, of of anybody that you could possibly think of, as the scripture tells us about these shepherds. Shepherds were despised uh, by the Jews in particular. They were considered to be an unclean uh, people. The shepherds were uh, people that worked always outdoors. They often smelled like sheep, and they uh, were uh, men that lived a very uh, very solitude, uh, uh, in, in in a very solitary type of a lifestyle. And these were not the kinds of people that you and I would say, who should be the first ones to hear about the coming of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And yet it was to these men that the message came first, common working men. And when I read the Christmas story, And when I identify with characters in the Christmas story, it's normally with these men that I identify with because all of us are common men and women. We're sinners that apart from the saving grace of God have no hope. And I don't know about you, I'm glad the gospel came to common men. I'm glad that God shows us in this passage that the gospel is really for everyone. And so we see uh, a wonderful condescension of, of our Savior coming down to common men. And by the way, Let's always remember where we are without Christ. And that is, we are sinners lost and without hope were it not for Jesus Christ. Let's not get the idea, well, you know, I'm not as bad as some. You know, I'm an American. I kind of deserve this. Listen, none of us deserve heaven. None of us deserve Jesus. And the shepherds show us that he came down uh, to a needy human race. But notice, secondly, not only did he come to common men, but we see that he came Uh, and we see that he is our eternal savior. This wonderful condescension is from an eternal savior. Now let's just notice what it says here in Luke 2 and verse number nine, something specific. It says, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. Now I want you to take note of this phrase, the angel of the Lord. Let's say that together, shall we? The angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is not a mere angel. Uh, We read and studied a few weeks ago about Gabriel. Gabriel was the angel that was often announcing the coming of the Lord. And we've studied other angels in the Bible. But this angel is a special visible appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, Theologians refer to this type of an appearance as a Christophany. It is the angel of the Lord. It is Christ. Uh, in angelic form, uh, speaking down to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem. Now, this is an awesome uh, principle and an awesome thought as you consider that Jesus is laying in the manger in Bethlehem, and at the same time, he is hovering over these shepherds, telling them about his presence in Bethlehem. To me, that is awesome to just think about. Uh, And someone might say, well, I don't get that, because how can he be in the manger and over the mountains of Bethlehem at the same time? Very good question, because now you're beginning to understand the identity of who Jesus is. If Jesus Christ is God, and he is, then he must possess the attributes of the Godhead, such attributes 
attributes as being all powerful, as being all knowing, or in this case, as being omnipresent. Listen, friends, if Jesus can't be in the manger and at the hillside at the same time, how can he be in my heart and your heart and your heart at the same time? How many of you are glad that he is omnipresent? He is with those that are worshiping him in Asia and Africa and Europe and America, all of us today. This is a wonderful picture of the omnipresence of Jesus Christ. He is called here the angel of the Lord. He is the one who appeared to Joseph, telling Joseph not to fear taking Mary as his wife, Matthew 1 and 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take Mary unto thee, to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And so we see in Luke 2 this condescension of Jesus to our low estate. He comes to common men, and the message comes from an eternal Savior. But then he comes with a very certain message. And I want you to see that message in verse uh, number uh, 10. We read, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring unto you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now let's notice this very certain message that is given. First of all, it's in a message of assurance. And you'll see the words there, fear not. And uh, I want you to picture that in your mind. I mean, imagine, you know, you're a seasoned shepherd. You've spent most of your life out on the hillside. It's quiet. There's the moon. There's stars, sometimes some wind, maybe a coyote in the distance. And, uh, you know, you're just out there on the hills and suddenly the angel of the Lord is hovering over you, illuminated with light all about him. And he's speaking unto you. How many of you would say, if I was one of those shepherds, I would really, really appreciate the words, fear not, right? I mean, I would, I would be glad to know that this is a friendly meeting right here. And the very first assurance that is given is the assurance from these words, fear not, now, our world is filled with fear today. Many in this room possess fear. People worry about the economy. They worry about their babies and their baby's health and their health. And they worry about uh, the future and they worry about their job and how are we going to get everything done. And, and what I want you to know is that we serve a God whose message in those moments is fear not. God has not given you the spirit of fear. Uh, social media maybe gave it to you. The news might have given it to you, but God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. And God's message as he speaks to these shepherds is, fear not. No, you don't need to freak out. He says, hey, listen, it's okay. It's me and I'm here for you. It's a message of assurance. But then secondly, it's a message of acceptance. The Bible says here in verse number 10, the angel said, fear not for behold, I bring unto you a good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now the acceptance is shown in the phrase, I'm bringing good news. I'm bringing good tidings of great joy. Notice specifically he says, and this good news, it's for all people. Listen, it's not just for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles. It's, it's for everybody, anyone and everyone that wants to hear it. This is good news for you. Isaiah 45 and verse 22 says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. Isaiah 9 and verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath he shined this light. You see, the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus is not for a select few. It's not for one race. It's for the human race. It's for everyone. It is for all people. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is a wonderful condescension from a loving God to a sinful humanity. All all of humanity have been given this promise that Jesus Christ has come as the Savior of the world. And so we see a wonderful condescension. But notice, secondly, this wonderful salvation. You see, Jesus didn't come uh, just because. He, he came with a purpose. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came with a wonderful plan of salvation. Notice in verse 11 again, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a, what's the next word? Savior. Say it with me, a what? Savior. Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 
Now this salvation, how many of you are saved this morning? Amen. This salvation, it is a wonderful salvation. Let me give you two or three reasons why. First of all, it is wonderful because it is personal. Jesus is speaking to these shepherds and he says, hey, unto you is born this day. This is not something for the other guys. This is something for you. Unto you is born this day in the city of David. A Savior. This is an invitation to the shepherds to meet their personal Savior. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. It's a very personal invitation. It's a whosoever invitation. If you will receive this invitation, it's something that you can personally receive today. And then I want you to see that this salvation is not only a personal gift, but secondly, it is a prepared gift. Uh, my wife last night was, was uh, uh, opening boxes uh, that had been shipped in from Amazon. We ought to just have a shipping department right now at our house, I think. Shipping and receiving, that's, uh, that's what we ought to call our kitchen these days. And, and uh, she's got stuff coming in. Of course, she's always telling me, don't look at that box. All right, I won't look at it. It's a cardboard box. It's like, what are you going to, it, it doesn't say on the box what it is, but I'm not allowed to look at those boxes. And, and uh, she gets all this stuff wrapped up, you know, and and, and she delights in it. She just delights in it. And she has a, the gift of giving, and she's uh, excited. She names every one of our grandchildren a different name every year, one of, the, uh, one of uh, uh, Santa's reindeer names. And so they're all these different names, and so they can't guess what their gift is. And she just delights in all of it. And she prepares and prepares. But when I think about what God did for our salvation and the preparation of it all, it overwhelms me. You see, it was all prophesied in the Old Testament. And in, in recent weeks, we've seen that he prophesied where Jesus would be born, Micah 5, 2. He prophesied in Isaiah 7, 14, how Jesus would be born, that he would be born of a virgin. And, and throughout the Old Testament, he was preparing Israel for the coming of Messiah, Isaiah 45, 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it? from that time. Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. God says, since the ancient times, I've been telling you that I am your Savior and to look to me. Uh, he tells us that the Savior is eternal. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. In other words, he took the form of a man in Bethlehem, but he is eternally preexistent as the Son of God. And we see the Savior in prophecy. We see the Savior in eternity. It was the Savior that spoke. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus Christ spoke these words. He is the Savior of eternity. We see him in prophecy. We see him in eternity. But I want you also to think of the Savior in theology because Christmas forms the theological foundation for the Christian faith. I want you to understand the word Savior speaks of Jesus as our deliverer, as the one who will deliver us from the penalty of sin. For according to the word of God, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wrath of God abides on those who have not received Jesus Christ as Savior. And Jesus came to deliver us from that wrath. Notice, if you would, a great Christmas verse, Hebrews 2.17. It says, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now, Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus took the form of a man. Here in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says that it behooved him similarly to take the form of a man, to, to be made like unto his brethren. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, was made like unto his brethren. He took a physical body. He became uh, God in the flesh. And he did this that he might be a faithful high priest. What did the high priest do in the Old Testament? The high priest on the Day of Atonement sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, and this became the covering for sin. 
And in doing this, the high priest made reconciliation for the sin, and he created access from man to God through the atoning blood that was shed. Jesus Christ took the form of a man so that he could shed his blood on the cross so that there would be a means of reconciliation so that those of us who are sinners and we all are sinners could come to Jesus Christ and we could be reconciled to God by Jesus Christ. This is the theology of Christmas. God became man and dwelt among us and he shed his blood in order to reconcile us to God because we were separated from God in our sin. And Jesus Christ as our Savior brings justification to all who will believe. Romans 5 and verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He justifies all who turn to him. If you today would realize, and if you today would admit that you are a sinner and turn to Jesus Christ and seek forgiveness, he will justify you. Uh, he will cleanse you. He will give reconciliation to you. And to those that are justified, he promises that he will keep your soul until the day of your redemption. Notice if you would in your notes, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. By the way, if you are saved, you have made a reservation for heaven. You have a home reserved in heaven. But notice verse 5. It says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. If you have been saved, the Bible says, that you are kept by the power of God. You are kept not by your power, not by this church. This church does not hold the keys to your salvation. You are kept by the power of God until your salvation. It is Jesus Christ himself who keeps your soul. This is why we pause this month and say in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift that he would justify me, that he would redeem me, that he would keep me. This is what it means when the Bible uses this simple word, a Savior. This is what the Savior has done. He has reconciled you to God. He has forgiven your sin. He is keeping your soul. But then notice there in verse number 11, not only does it say that we have a Savior, but there are two other words, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior which is Christ the Lord. Now Christ, this word means the anointed one. It was Peter in Luke chapter 9 and verse 20. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You see, folks, this morning, the word Christ means that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. He was not just some other guy that died on that cross. He was the very anointed Messiah. And so we see that Jesus is the Savior. He is the Christ. And then notice thirdly, he is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the ruler over all. Acts 2 and verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. Jesus Christ is offering a personal relationship. It is for all people. Jesus Christ is offering a prepared relationship prophesied in the Old Testament. But notice thirdly, it is available to you today. This salvation, this salvation, this relationship with Jesus is available to all. Verse 12, and this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now, the angel of the Lord did not come to these shepherds and say, hey, great news. Over there in Bethlehem, there is a Savior, Christ the Lord, in fact, he is there in Bethlehem, lying in a manger, and he's come to be the Savior of the world, but you better stay away from him. You better stay away from him. Uh, he's not for common men like you. He's just for the select few. He's just for a few powerful kings and rulers and wealthy people. We wanted you to know he came, but it's not something that's available for you. In fact, Jesus said just the opposite in verse 12. 
He said, I'm going to give you a sign. I want you to know that he's over there in Bethlehem. He's in a manger. He's in a stable area. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. If you will, what the Lord is doing is giving directions to these shepherds. He's saying, I want you to come to me. I want you to know where I'm at. I want you to have a relationship with me. And directions are important because a wise man wants to know, how do I find salvation? How can I come to the Savior? I heard about a lady named Janet, and she was going to visit her dad for the, uh, uh, for the holidays. and uh, Rather, her dad was going to visit her for the holidays. And, and uh, she called her dad up on the phone. She said, Dad, do you know where our new house is? you know how to get here? And, and, um, and he said, yep. He said, no problem. He said, I have uh, my GPS. And he said, I have my GPS override also. And she said, GPS override? What's your GPS override? She said, he said, oh, that's your mother. Uh, she's my GPS override. And some of you might have a GPS override like that. Well, the GPS in this case was the Lord himself. And the Lord is saying, here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that you can come to Bethlehem. You're going to find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And when you visit Bethlehem, it really is just kind of a, a hillside place with little uh, areas uh, where the sheep are kept and the pastures. And, and uh, there are some stables there, some places where uh, you might envision in your mind that Jesus could have been kept in a, a stable area. And, and of course, uh, modern Bethlehem is, is somewhat built up. There's uh, some buildings there on what is called the West Bank. There is the Church of the Nativity there, uh, which is the, near the spot, it is believed, where Jesus was born. But the significance of Bethlehem as the city of David is found in the fact that Bethlehem means the house of bread. And Jesus said in John's Gospel, I am the bread of life. It is significant that Jesus was born there to offer himself as the bread of life. And it is significant that the Lord says, this is a place that you can come to. It is a person that is approachable. There is room for you there. There was no room for Jesus in the end, but you can come and you can visit him. Someone said Christ was content with the stable when he was born so that we could have a mansion when we die. How many of you know that Jesus said to his disciples before he went back up into heaven, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. How many of you understand heaven is a place? Place. It's a prepared place. And while Jesus was laid in a stable area, you and I have a promised place for us. He was laid specifically in a manger. I've thought about that some this week, this manger. I used to think that the manger was like made out of wood from Home Depot, you know, and uh, it was just uh, kind of a, had some straw in it. And years ago when we visited the Holy Land, I realized mangers in the Bible lands were carved out of limestone. They were rough. They were cold. They were no doubt dirty. And no doubt they were very smelly. And this was the place where the Son of God was laid. I heard about a boy who got a hamster for Christmas one year. And oh, the room smelled so bad. His room smelled so bad. Uh, after a while, the hamster got used to it. But still, it just smelled so bad. The boy's room did. And if you have boys, you know what I'm talking about. When you think about Jesus being laid in a smelly place like that, when you think about this trough where he was laid, you're mindful of what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. This is what Jesus did to bring salvation to us. He took the form of a man. He humbled himself. He took and impoverished himself in order that we might have the riches of his forgiveness. What a wonderful salvation. We see a wonderful condescension. Jesus Christ coming down to us, coming to all men. We see a wonderful salvation. That is that we are justified. We are reconciled. We can be brought to God through Jesus Christ, his son. But notice thirdly this morning, a wonderful adoration. Now, once this story is told, once this message is given, 
given to the shepherds. Notice in verse 13 it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. We see this adoration comes first from this angelic host. And, and it is a multitude, uh, an assemblage of angels that are now appearing with the, the angel of the Lord. And, and again, if the shepherds weren't kind of in shock already, no doubt at this moment they are overwhelmed with what they are seeing. And we have learned that the purpose of the angel uh, these angels were messengers from God. They were subject to God. And they are bringing praise to the message of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We get a glimpse into the ministry of the angels in Revelation chapter 5. And I put it in your notes, verse 11. It says, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The angels are singing praise to God. They're on the hillside of Bethlehem. They are worshiping and they are singing praise, giving out praise to the Lord in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. Hebrews 1 and 6 tells us, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. You know, for all of eternity, the angels will praise the Lord, and we will as well. And we will say, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And so this adoration is from this angelic host. But as we close this morning, I want you to notice, secondly, it was from the shepherds themselves. Now notice what the Bible tells us here about the shepherds. Notice, if you would, in verse 15. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them, concerning this child. Now, there are a couple of lessons we can learn from these shepherds, and I want you to get this. I want you to see, first of all, the shepherds searched for Christ. The Bible says in verse number 16, they came with haste. They came to find the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm, 11, Psalm 111 and verse 2, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. These shepherds were seeking the Lord. I want to challenge you this month to seek the Lord, whether that means getting saved, coming to know him as your savior, whether that means knowing him more personally. We see the shepherds as they are searching for Christ. And then we see the shepherds as they saw the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says they found Mary, Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. They saw him personally. The Bible says in Matthew 1 and 23 that this Jesus, his name is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And as they saw him, they saw Emmanuel, God with us. One of my favorite Christmas songs, I'm hoping we'll hear it later this month, is the song entitled, Mary, Did You Know? And the answer to that question is, yes, Mary knew. And yes, the shepherds knew. They knew exactly who this was. This was Emmanuel, God with us. They searched for him and they saw him. And then I want you to see, thirdly, they served him. You see, you can't really come to know Christ without having a desire to serve him. Someone that is truly saved is going to have some changes in their life. They're going to become a new creature. They're going to live for him. They're going to tell others about him. Call it soul winning. Call it what you want. You cannot be silent about this Jesus Christ. These shepherds made known what they had heard. The Bible says in verse 17, when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. You know, last year at Christmas time, companies like Apple and Nike and, and uh, uh, Macy's and companies like this spent $2.5 billion advertising their products to Americans. $2.5 billion. In fact, 50% of the advertising budget for these companies is spent in the month of December because they want you to know about their products. But ladies and gentlemen, we have a savior. And I submit to you that this month is a month for us 
to make known to others who Jesus Christ is. Psalm 66 and verse 16. Come and hear all ye that fear God and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. And I'm telling you, if God can use these common shepherds with their dirty hands and their smelly clothing to pronounce that Jesus was born, God can use every one of us. You say, I, I don't know what to say. I'm a little backward. I, I, it's just a little hard. I'm a little busy. I'm telling you that God wants all of us to serve the Lord Jesus, to tell others of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not long ago, I drove by a church and uh, being a pastor, I'm just interested in churches, parking lots, uh, porches, uh, bulletins, just whatever I can see about churches uh, always interests me. And, and I saw this sign on the front of the church and it said, be the church. And I thought, yeah, be the church. That's, that's a good one. What does that mean to them? You know, because different people have different ideas about what church is. And so here's be the church. All right. Protect the environment. Well, all right. You know, care for the poor. Sure. Forgive often. Yep. Reject racism. Fight the powerless. Fight for the powerless. Uh, share earthly possessions. Embrace diversity. I'm beginning to sense, all right, this is probably a church that's going or gone woke and they're promoting the LBGTQ movement now and, and you're loving God. Absolutely. Enjoy this life. You know, all these little sayings and, and, uh, and, and I could take a few minutes and probably pick a few of those apart, but just for the sake of the time here, I began to think about this. Be the church. And yet not one thing is said on this sign about what the church is supposed to do. The church of the living God is to be the pillar and the ground of truth. That is, we are to lift up the truth and specifically Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. The responsibility of the church is to preach the birth, the virgin birth, the death, the blood atonement, the literal burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not one thing is said on this sign about preaching Christ. And that is the calling of the New Testament church. And in this day, as churches are going into social justice theology and into woke uh, uh, thought and into all kinds of progressiveness, there's a problem with it. And the biggest problem is that while they talk about the gospel, they are not preaching the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The shepherds did not go all around Bethlehem saying, hey, we want to give you a message. We want to talk to you about uh, inequity. We want to talk to you about justice. We want to talk to you about social issues. No, 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 no. They had one major theme on their heart and from their tongue, and that theme was Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Let's never get tired of hearing the name and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a great commission. It is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And churches are being tricked by Satan today as they get involved in this ideology and that ideology and this false teaching and that false teaching. And they think they're doing a wonderful work and they're trying to solve all of the world's problems. I'll tell you how to get two people from different backgrounds to love each other. Get them both to meet Jesus Christ. Get two people saved. They're going to start loving each other. Yeah, but well, what if one's white and one is black? If they got Jesus in their heart, they're going to love each other. The shepherds, when they saw Jesus, when they came to know who Jesus was, they just couldn't get over it. They had to tell others about it. One of the ways to know if you've lost the wonder of it all, are you still telling people about Jesus like you did when you first got saved? Remember when you first got saved? You wanted to tell other people how to get saved. Come on, somebody help me here this morning. One of the ways to know if it's kind of gotten a little old and crusty is if you're not talking about Jesus like you once did. Boy, those shepherds, they had to go tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, but Pastor Chapel, I mean, I'm here in church today and I, I, I like missionaries and I, I like to have hot chocolate and cookies after the Christmas program and all that's wonderful. But I'm asking you, are you still telling people personally about Jesus Christ? And then I want you to notice finally, they glorified the Lord. Verse 20, the Bible says, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. You know, when you think about salvation, there's so many wonderful things that encompass salvation. We've mentioned some this morning, being justified. How many of you are glad you've been justified before God? Just as if you've never sinned. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm glad I've been justified. I've been sanctified. I've been set apart. I'm thankful for that. How many of you are glad that you're being kept, that your soul is in God's keeping today? How many of you are thankful for that? But then we see here this word glorified. And the chief end of man is to glorify God 
These shepherds were glorifying God with their lives. They weren't getting over what God had done for them. They were bringing praise to his name. I read of an old pioneer who was traveling across the Great Plains coming out west. He and his wife, you know, they had a little covered wagon. They're coming out to the west. And suddenly they came up to this huge chasm. I mean, it's a mile deep. It's like 10 miles wide and 100 miles long. We know of it as the Grand Canyon. He looked at that canyon and he looked at his wife and he said, man, something must have happened here. <laughs> something did happen there. God created it. Amen. Amen. Something must have happened here. Do you know there's people that you work with, people that live by you, and they see the Christmas lights, and they hear about programs and the decorations, and they see all of it, and they kind of get into it. They, they don't even necessarily believe in God. They just, you know, it's kind of a holiday for them. Happy holidays. But there are some people who are going to see these things, and they're going to hear about services like tonight, and some of them are going to stop and they're going to say, something must have happened here. What's at the core of this? What, what's this all about? What's at the root of all of this? What is that joy to the world? The Lord is come. What is that all about? And may we be the shepherds who make known abroad what we have seen and what we have heard. Because there has been a wonderful condescension, God coming down to us. He has brought a wonderful salvation through our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And because of that, we must wonderfully adore and worship and serve the one who has come for all of us. May it be true in our lives this 